now we're going to talk about sources of capital that specifically um, have an interest in and somewhat of a focus on the ophthalmic sector. Uh, we've Earlier in the day, we've talked about the public um, uh, market, the IPO market, and so forth. And now we're really going to talk about uh, sources of capital for the earlier private stage of, uh, of development. And what I'm going to do is ask uh, each of the panel members to begin the process by introducing themselves and describe what their fund is and how ophthalmology fits in, into that fund. Uh, we'll go uh, from, from the far side, this direction, please. Sure. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Rothman. Uh, I am the uh, founder and managing member of InFocus Capital Partners. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am a practicing glaucoma specialist. Uh, and in my spare time, I uh, manage this fund. Um, we are a life science fund with a 90% focus on ophthalmology. My co-founder is also a practicing ophthalmologist, Ron Weiss. He is based out of Chicago, and I am based uh, out of New York. Um, we launched the fund in January of 2018. Uh, we have raised a significant amount of capital. We should be announcing the close of our fund um, sometime in the month of June. Um, we currently have four uh, portfolio companies. Uh, some of them are in this room at the moment. And we will continue to make investments over the course of the next 18 to 24 months. Our target is to have between 12 and 15 companies inside of the portfolio um, by the time we're done. Uh, we do try and limit our investments to uh, one to five million dollars. Uh, we do have some risk mitigation strategies inside of our fund uh, regarding how much of any particular deal we will take. Uh, we have served as both lead investor and co-investor. Our team is made up of uh, nine advisors, uh, key opinion leaders, uh, all of whom are practicing ophthalmologists uh, and um, business development uh, and finance professionals. And also, um, we will be announcing officially by press, but you can uh, be aware of it now, that we have just uh, structured a formal partnership with Aura, the clinical research organization, who is now an official partner of our fund. Uh, so we believe that the combination of um, ophthalmologists finance professionals and a uh, uh, well-regarded clinical research organization under one roof provides us with a substantial ability to not only perform high-level diligence, but also uh, greatly enhance the success of our portfolio companies. Thank you, Rob. Firas? Hi. Uh, my name is Firas Rahal, and I'm also a practicing ophthalmologist. I happen to be a retina surgeon in Los Angeles. Maybe I'm the only retina surgeon at this entire weekend. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I know a lot of you people anyway, and I'm still practicing nearly full time basically, and I'm a member of Excite Capital. Excite Ventures now is the name. We started Excite Ventures officially in 2014, but we didn't make an, our first investment until the second half of 2016. Excite is a group of seven members, two are ophthalmologists, both of us are, are retina surgeons. Uh, three are investment professionals who have a background in VC or worked in uh, biotech investing, and two are attorneys who also have a background in VC and business. We're located in Boston, New York, and Los Angeles. The, the largest group is in New York, and Los Angeles is just me. And uh, we invest solely in ophthalmology. These guys are 90% ophthalmology. So far, we're solely ophthalmology, and that is our focus and our intent and our MO. It can be therapeutics, uh, devices, or diagnostics. We're interested in all of the above, and we've made investments into all three of those categories thus far. Very good. Thank you. Jeff? Hi, I'm Jeff Weinhoff. I'm the managing partner at Visionary Ventures. Visionary is a three-year-old ophthalmology-only fund focused on acting as a lead investor and an active board member, A rounds and later. So we are invested in devices and drugs. Uh, we have a unique business model that centers around 
partnering with 44 of the leading key opinion leaders in ophthalmology, all of whom are investors in our fund. And we've had a good start to being in the ophthalmology investing business. We have nine portfolio companies, eight are successful. And uh, we had two exits last year and the returns are enough that we're um, happy with our existing partners. So we, uh, that's what we do and, and we, uh, and we're tending to be on the, not the seed stage, but really at the point where we can deploy capital and look at, look at uh, creating a value inflection point in two to four years. Tyler. Tyler Stillwater. I'm with Blue Stem Capital. We're located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, we've been in business now for north of 25 years. All of our money comes from high net worth individuals. We have no institutional money. We're in the process of investing our 21st fund. Uh, you know, historically we've been agnostic as it relates to industries. Uh, I mean, we've invested in everything from energy, light manufacturing, software companies, uh, real estate. Uh, in the last, uh, uh, since 2015, we've now invested in eight ophthalmology slash eye care companies. Uh, our our niche, or I should say our area is probably, uh, our sweet spot is uh, ACE, A round companies, uh, although we have invested, made a couple seed investments, we made later stage investments. At the end of the day, we're capitalists and we're going to go to where the opportunities are. Arjun. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arjun, I'm a principal at KKR, much like the ophthalmic industry, KKR is a global investment firm. We have about 50 people or so doing healthcare across the world. In the Americas, that's about 25 of us. We invest healthcare across multiple strategies. That's both scaled investing in large cap companies for control and also growth investing for innovation. And we also have a credit arm that focuses on healthcare. Um, I think most relevant to this group is sort of our interest in ophthalmology probably started out on the scale side where we owned and then took public NVI, which is the OD platform. Uh, we also own Amsurge and through that touch a lot of ophthalmologists, some of whom maybe even in this room. Uh, and that sort of started our interest and our familiarity. In we then grew from that into our growth effort uh, which is a billion and a half dollars healthcare dedicated growth fund. From that, we made a capital commitment which is dedicated to ophthalmology. That pocket is called Falcon Vision, and we're really there focused on innovation stage companies in ophthalmology that's both pharma, devices, diagnostics, but really covering the range to bring problem-solving solutions both for patients and then also for the practices and the surgeons, many of whom are on stage today as well. Gar Hang. Uh, hi, good afternoon. I'm Gar Hang Kong. I uh, manage a firm called HealthQuest Capital. We're based in the San Francisco Bay Area. We also have colleagues on the East Coast in Florida as well. I'm the only non-practicing physician in my family, <laughs> so I don't see any patients. Uh, but uh, we do focus uh, exclusively, of course, on healthcare, but across the full spectrum, to be fair. So we invest in devices, diagnostics, digital health, innovative services. Uh, and we're not an ophthalmology focused fund, but I went back and counted. Our team has been involved with uh, 10 ophthalmology investments, uh, most recently, Avidro, which went public, and we're really uh, pleased to be partnered with the team over at Avidro. Um, we announced a new fund earlier. Uh, this year, actually just last month, which is a $446 million vehicle. So we write checks between 10 and 40. Uh, love to syndicate, participate, lead. Uh, and um, with respect to the kinds of companies, everything that we invest in is commercial in nature. Uh, there's no revenue requirement, but uh, somewhere along that commercial uh, journey. And I have to say, I've been doing this 21 years, eight funds, but I've never met somebody who's done 21 funds. So. New for me and very cool. Very good. Thank you uh, for that nice overview from each of the funds. Um, what a, I thought it might be interesting to hear what your criteria are 
for ophthalmic opportunities. Okay, each of us as investors, when we <clears throat> evaluate an opportunity, we have some kind of a bucket list of, okay, here's, here's what I'm looking for. And so, Garhang, why don't you start, and then just let's just have a conversation about the criteria that you use to drive investments. Yeah, so for, uh, for our situation at HealthQuest, you know, I shared that we're commercially oriented investment firm. So everything that we pursue and engage with, by definition, is already approved, whether it be a device or a pharmaceutical or a service. Uh, so that's sort of the first uh, line for us. I would say the others are capital requirement. Um, so it's, to be fair, hard for us to write one or two or three million dollar checks. Uh, it's also hard for us to write 100 or 200 million dollar checks. So really, uh, most of the companies that we're involved with are raising 20, 30, 40, 50 million, and you know, we're providing some meaningful portion of that. Uh, and then the types of companies that uh, we like to pursue within ophthalmology, you know, one of the things that's attractive about the sector is that it's a quite efficient sector in terms of commercialization. You don't need 500 sales reps to go out there. Uh, and so we tend to like uh, companies that are focused, specialized, whether it be front of the eye or back of the eye. To be fair, we're probably less likely to do a full-on consumer medical product where you know, advertising and all that uh, is involved as well. Uh, and then just from a timeline point of view, you know, on average, we're probably partners with companies for, call it four years, so sometimes it's three, sometimes it's seven, but from a time frame point of view, that's how we think about it. Time to exit is, what, what's your sense? About four years. About four years is your target. Yep. Yep, got it. Arjun? Yep. No, I think for criteria, and I'll start with really Falcon Vision here, it was in, built that way to create that flexible solution where we can start small and then help companies scale as and if that's appropriate. But from a criteria, it sort of has to start for us with the team um, and everyone managing it. There's a lot of experience in this room, there's a lot of expertise, and there are a lot of relationships. And I think it's a small community, as Garhang said, but it's also one you got to make sure you can access in the right way. So I think it starts with us for the team. I think then it comes down to problem solving, and that to us what innovation is, if it's a differentiated clinical solution for the patient, either on vision or on disease management, but is it also an efficient, helpful solution for the practice? Is it disruptive to the workflow? Is it aid the workflow? What is reimbursement? Is there a strategy and a criteria that can help drive that and make it easier for the distribution through the uh, ophthalmology channel and others? So that's kind of how we think about that. The problem solving has to work for both sides. Um, and then, you know, I think the, really it's worth mentioning, I think from a stage perspective, you know, we're very comfortable taking, being a part of clinical stage development, but I think the approach to that is to have a validated and understood FDA strategy, one that we can sort of really engage on and uh, sort of have the conversation about how the milestones would stack up. I know Bill will ask me about timing, so I'll, I'll take that up front. We don't have a specific timing to exit, but I do think for value creation of value crystallization milestones somewhere in the three to five year time horizon. Tyler. You know, so there's no MDs or PhDs at Blue Stem Capital. So you know what, we really rely on our network that we've established over the years to really help us understand not over only market size, but help us validate the technology. I mean, we're fortunate enough to have Vance Thompson Vision located right in our backyard, and Vance and John are more than willing to give of their time to help really help us uh, understand technologies of, of the, and then on top of that, of the five of the eight uh, investments we've made in this space, we've co-invested with visionary ventures on. And, you know, Jeff is more than willing to open up and uh, allow us to speak to his KOLs at the same point in time. So we really use that network, but, it, you know, as both gentlemen have already said, it really starts and ends with the people. I mean, you know, one of my partners is fond of saying, you can't do a good deal with bad people and you can't do a bad deal with good people. I mean, it's really about 
picking your partners wisely. It's not only just the management team, but it's also the board, and then it's also about making sure that you've got a good syndicate on the cap table, because we all know things do happen. You know, Bill mentioned it earlier, you know, you're constantly reiterating and trying to figure out new things because nothing ever runs perfectly. So you just got to make sure at all three of those levels that you've got a good team in place to operate. You've got a good board that understands and is patient with its management team. And then you've got a syndicate of investors uh, that have a deep enough pocket that are willing to go along with the opportunity because, you know, there's very few of these that result in one round of financing and then you, you, you realize an exit. I mean, we're here for the journey. You know, you know, as it relates to uh, length of investment, we tell our entrepreneurs, operate the company as if you're going to own it forever because then you're going to make just good, solid business decisions. With that said, you know, usually call it in that four to seven year time period. Got it. Yep, thanks. Jeff? Okay, well, I hate to do it again, but the team is the most important thing. Um, beyond that, I think it's pretty simple uh, in concept, but a lot more difficult in execution. So this is all about quality IP, serving big unmet medical needs, where you can make a meaningful improvement in the standard of care, get paid for it, have either re reimbursement or a cash pay option that you're sure you can do, and a predictable clinical pathway where you can know you get through it and get it done. So we're looking in the device side and expect that we're actually gonna have to take these things out of the clinic through approval and then early stage commercialization. And that doesn't mean we throw up our hands then and say our job's done. But we've just created an option for a strategic partner to look at that thing and say, gee, we can globalize that, that product. We don't have to see you do a thousand practices adopt that. So, you know, 50 practices really embedding this into their practice is important. But that's really what we look for. And, and um, you know, I think, I think that we were on a panel earlier with John Badal today, and, and, you know, that panel's emphasis was on getting paid. And I think it's super important to figure out how you can not only solve the clinical problems, but how you can solve the reimbursement or market problems and make sure that you have something that is of value to patients and to uh, the bigger universe. Because there's an industrial logic that, you know, single or two product companies don't make good independent entities. They're better off as part of a bigger platform. And I think we've already talked about timing. We're out in two to four years. Yeah, so I think uh, on the earlier stage, which is where we kind of live based on our size, uh, there are some unique challenges. And uh, it's fairly, for us, specific related to whether it's a device or a drug. This, not checklist, but the things we might uh, consider important and validating for us. So for example, on a device side, uh, it would have to be further along and we would, as clinicians, and we have two in the group and we have advisors in clinical areas that we're not expert in. It makes sense, and, and you said this earlier and I agree 100%, it has to make sense not just that it has efficacy, but that it has to fit in the flow of the current and the coming five years of the market of ophthalmology, the clinical practice of ophthalmology, and the economics that are coming, not that are necessarily here. That can be a challenge with a device. So that, that's a conversation we have a lot of in the early stage investment. On the drug side, it's a little different because if a, if a drug is amazing, it's amazing, and it's gonna fit in, and somebody's gonna find a way to use it, and somebody's gonna find a way to get it paid. On the drug side, for us, the challenge is really, um, we really have to believe in the asset. The, the, the usual suspects, as everyone has said here, asset management team, market. We talk less about the market because we're in it. We're in it as clinicians. We're in it as uh, investors and uh, consistently. So we don't have to hear too much from the, the innovator, uh, the founders about the market. But uh, for the drug, the asset has to really move us, has to be super compelling because as earlier stage investors, of course, the risk is high and the road is long, and we are gonna have to make a decision on animal data and lab data. It's not likely we might be seeing a lot of clinical stuff at our stage for drugs. We do it for devices and require that. But uh, so it's a you know, higher risk area, of course, everybody knows that. So for drugs, uh, it's gotta be a super compelling asset. The management team critical 
But strangely enough, at that early stage, the management team can be changed. I'm not suggesting that's a strategy anybody goes into, but if the asset doesn't work, you know, you, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Agree, Rob. So um, just because I don't want to be left out, I'll tell you that our, our first three checks, check boxes on our diligence list are management, management, management. So, so that's, that's one, two, and three. Um, and you know, our compulsion as physicians is to fund companies that deserve to be funded, uh, companies whose products are going to make life better for me and my friends and the people who continue to practice ophthalmology. But having said that, we're not a charity and we have a responsibility to our investors to provide a return. And we've, we view our, our mission as trying to de-risk an investment in life sciences at an early stage to the point that it either works or it doesn't. And we understand that we're investing in, in, in drugs or devices that may not work. They might not actually achieve their endpoint. But if we can de-risk the investment to the point that that's the only thing left, then we think we've done a really good job. And that involves all the things you've heard before, not only understanding the science and the market, which, which we do very well, but also understanding the FDA clinical trials pathway and the reimbursement landscape. Um, you know, those, are, those are the challenges in, in early investing. We do seed round investments. We do early investments in A rounds. We're not um, specific for those, but that tends to be where most will occur due to the fact that we are a smaller fund. And uh, like Farah said, I think the challenges are somewhat greater at, at that stage. Um, with regard to timeline, um, we are a 10-year fund. We would like to see our investments monetize the day after we make our investment. Um, that would be ideal, but we'll certainly accept um, uh, five to seven years as a reasonable timeline depending on, on the asset. We've talked a lot about um, what's attractive about the ophthalmic sector, you know, what, why we're here, why we're you know, doing what we're doing at various stages and sizes and so forth. What's broken here? What, what part of the ophthalmic sector could be better? What, what do we wish was, was better? I'll start. Um, not a lot. I think, it, it, I think it's a pretty cool sector. And I, I practice clinically and as an investor, so I, I love this space, obviously. Uh, but because there have been, at least on the drug side, uh, in the last decade in my segment of the eye and the retina, just unbelievable blockbuster developments that have you know, taken over the space. The drugs, you know, the anti-VEGF drugs, everyone in this room knows about them. Uh, there's a compulsion for a Me Too phenomenon in that space. And uh, I'm often hearing, especially being a retina doctor, the pitch for uh, the next greatest. And, this is, you know, generational, multi-generational high bar that we've achieved with anti-VEGF drugs. And I, I often caution people to make sure they're, they're looking at potential other avenues for their particular asset, let's say in the posterior segment, if they want to go up head to head against 90% anti-VEGF success in these various huge marketplaces, right? It's an attractive marketplace for non-ophthalmic companies to come into ophthalmology, which is why it is a hot sector. The anti-VEGF drugs have set the stage for billion dollar blockbusters and I, I, I see probably more frequently than we should uh, a, a Me Too, go, let's go head to head with ILEA and Lucentis phenomena. You know, one comment, especially uh, maybe an observation as an investor who invests in ophthalmology, but broadly across different therapeutic areas, is the number of acquirers in ophthalmology is actually not that numerous. So the number of really large players who can spend large dollars buying uh, ophthalmology companies compared to some other therapeutic areas and categories is actually not as large as maybe an investor would like. And so I'm not sure there's a fix per se, but that's an observation, especially if your dollars are fungible and it can go to different locations. That's something that we think about. And it's not just ophthalmology, you know, OBGYN, there's other categories where there's just not that many acquirers, but it is something that we think about. Yeah. What else? Other other thoughts? I'll make an observation again, not a not something that needs to be fixed, but at least one that I think can be improved. And I'm a product of my own scars, but very often it's sight or vision is the domain of the OD. And disease management 
and surgery is the domain of the ophthalmologist. If you're a patient, you want quality of life. With rising life expectancies and expectations, it has to be bring together vision and disease management for ophthalmology in a more efficient way. And I think there is, there are, there's reason for the ODs and there's a reason for ophthalmologists and both do great work, but greater collaboration between those spaces I think will be helpful to patients and I think will really be helpful to some of the technologies, both pharma and, and devices that are trying to scale and trying to sort of marry that union. You know, maybe I'm going to come at it a little different way because we do invest in a whole bunch of other sectors. What I'm going to tell you is this sector is a lot less broken than most are. <laughs> less broken. Yeah, less broken. It, you know, there's a collaboration mm -hmm. that goes on here that you don't see elsewhere in a lot. You know, and one of the things, and it's, maybe it's less about the ophthalmology space and maybe it's more about our industry is, you had a segment, you know, you used to have people that made Series B and Series C stage investments, and they, they started moving later on. And, you know, and so there was a gap that exists in our industry for call it Series C, Series D, and you're starting, it's nice to have KKR at the table here and now because it's starting to bring some money back into that stage where there really was a gap here that needed to be filled because there was a lot of, early stage companies that were being developed, but you know, when you get to that stage where you're needing 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars at a crack, those are big checks to write. And you really have to have parties that have billion dollar funds or larger entities that are able to step up to the plate and help write that check. So, you know, I, I think that's a, a good addition to have KKR sitting here at the table with us. I think, you know, at least from the evaluation standpoint, I, th I think one of the biggest problems that we have now, at least in, in, in the diligence area, is trying to understand the reimbursement for products we're investing in today that, that may not be on the market for three or four or five years. And it's impossible to look at the current reimbursement landscape and try and make sense of what gets reimbursed at what level and what doesn't. And it's difficult when we don't have that clarity um, of, the, of the ultimate endpoint uh, when trying to determine if, if a product is fiscally viable. We understand that it may be clinically viable, but those decisions are, are incredibly challenging, and we just don't seem to have any ability to understand it any better because I don't think the people making the decisions understand it either. And it's so multivariable, and there's so many other factors that go into determining how much you're going to pay for a product ultimately that it's incredibly challenging. I don't know how you fix that, but. Well, and what's interesting is some of us really like the fact that we have a blend on reimbursement. We have private pay, self-pay, cash pay, and we have um, third-party reimbursement and obviously late stage, uh, you know, Medicare and so forth, but it adds complexity. It does. And we, we talked about it, and so getting down into those layers is, is non-trivial. So. And, and it is part of the process for determining um, the makeup of your portfolio. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts? So we're going to wrap now, and I thought it would be so interesting, hopefully, to hear the points of view from a range of investors that start with the very earliest pre-A series, with half a million to a million, and maybe a bit more, to those that want to engage at the Series A or so, want to deploy two, three, five million, um, and have some reserve on that, you know, to a, a, a leading firm that needs um, opportunities that are at the revenue stage and wants to deploy 10, 20, 30 million dollars. And so this really represents the spectrum of access to capital. Uh, and it's uh, a privilege, candidly, t uh, for me to have colleagues in this space that care about the eye. So thank you very much. Thank you.